Nick, we present the standard versus dysplastic inlay implant for patellofemoral arthritis. We summarize the key differences between the standard and dysplastic inlay implant regarding their indications, specific target, and complementary recommended exploration. ML and 30 degrees flex axial X-rays are analyzed to confirm isolated patellofemoral osteotitis, assess normal patella height, and determine the trochlear phenotype according to the Jewish scale. Additionally, MRI is recommended to assess cartilage damage and soft tissue health. Our approach follows the media parapatella technique as per author's preferences. Upon assessing the joint, we meticulously assess isolated femoropatellar arthritis and the unaffected femorotibial joint, alongside any potential trochlear dysplasia. The initial step involves sizing the trochlear groove curvature. As a tip, in cases of dysplasia, we recommend to take the measure on the lateral condyle. Next, the template is used to mark the center of the trochlea, followed by measuring the trochlea groove depth. Position the offset drill guide assuring four points contact, and we insert the pin aligned with the mark previously done. Double check implant positioning with the selected trial in place, maintaining a recommended 3 mm distance above the intercondyle and notch. Central and rimming is then performed over the pin guide with careful attention to up for 5 mm version when dealing with this plastic implant rim until the laser mark is surpassed. Subsequently, the guide block is positioned within the rimmed area and securely fixed with four pins. Careful manual handling prevents inadvertent ejection during pinning. In case of AP instability of the block, you may choose a smaller radius block with a higher numerical value. Similarly, for instance, of ML instability, it's advisable to initially opt for a larger radius block. If this measure fails to prevent instability, it could indicate the potential presence of severe trochlear dysplasia. In these cases, impacting the proximal fin of the block into the trochlea achieves final stability. Trim healthy cartilag edges and proceed with AP rimming until redefinition following the method outlined in this surgical technique. The trial implant is selected according to the previous measures and positioned aligning the lateral laser mark accurately on the rimmed area. At this point, determining the need for a dysplastic implant involves observing the presence of superior bony bump proximally over the trial. In such cases, an additional step entails guiding a pin through the cannulated AP ramer to the proximal structure. Subsequently, steps include superior overrimming with a specific umbrella shaped ramer for dysplastic implant. This slide shows visual comparisons illustrating the distinct bony resection areas between the standard and dysplastic inlay implants. The appropriate trial implant is selected and securely fastened with two short pins, followed by preparing the taper post bed using the drill guide, the step drill, and the tap. The taper post implantation follows with verification of correct positioning using a placement gouge. In cases involving severe osteoporotic patients, preassembling the implants on the table as depicted in the accompanying image is recommended. Final implantation involves a non-cemented approach for good bone quality or surface cement application for osteoporotic patients. For the patella, we recommend to opt for the anatomic implant version for individuals with smaller knees and the dome-shaped implant for those with larger knees. Adhere to the steps delineated in this technique, ensuring consistent application of cement through the process. Range of motion is then assessed. Finally, post-operative AP, ML and 30 degrees axial X-rays are taken to confirm implant positioning. This slide emphasizes the limit factors, available options, and the different surgical technique steps between the standard and dysplastic patellofemoral implants. Notably, dysplastic cases necessitate a minimum trochlear groove width of 42 mm and an additional proximal rimming to accommodate the implant. Lastly, we present a recommended rehabilitation protocol for this patient.